Hi, welcome back to the Doctors in Training Pharmacology Review course. This lecture is going to cover adrenal hormones, including your corticosteroids, uh, which includes two subcategories called glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids. Additionally, we will also be discussing inhibitors of adrenocorticoid biosynthesis. So corticosteroids, mineral corticoids, glucocorticoids, and inhibitors of those hormones. Um, if you are using Lippincott's 4th edition pharmacology, this lecture will correspond to chapter 26, but feel free to use whatever farm text you want because I'm sure they all have a section on adrenal hormones. Um, today's lecturer is Dr. Mike McGinnis, who is a board-certified internal medicine physician and one of our chief educators here at doctorsintraining.com. You will be seeing me intermittently throughout the lecture to review some key points and add in some additional high-yield information. So without further ado, Dr. Mike McGinnis. Hello, I'm Dr. Michael McKinnis. I'm an internist, and this lecture is on adrenal hormones. Now, there are lots of hormones and lots of uh, synthetic hormones and drugs that we use that we're going to talk about today. They have lots of different actions, lots of different sites of actions, and lots of different uses. Um, fortunately, the main differences in these drugs are based on their potency and their route of administration. Otherwise, these drugs pretty much have the same effects. The bulk of this lecture is going to be on corticosteroids, meaning the glucocorticoids and the mineralocorticoids. And really, we're mainly talking about glucocorticoids. So there are several classes of adrenal hormones to talk about. First off are the corticosteroids. As I mentioned, they're the mineralocorticoids. Uh, the main one produced in the body is aldosterone. And then there's the glucocorticoids. So the main one produced in the body is cortisol. Then we have the adrenal androgens, such as DHEA. Uh, we're not really going to cover that in this lecture at all. The estrogens and androgens uh, are covered in lecture number 25. And then finally, the uh, products of the adrenal medulla, uh, the catecholamines, including norepinephrine and epinephrine or adrenaline, um, are really covered in lecture number four. So again, we're mainly talking about the glucocorticoids and the mineralocorticoids today. Let's talk about the site of synthesis of these adrenal products. Uh, if you look at the image on the screen, you'll see the diagram of the adrenal gland. And working from the outside in, we have the, the cortex, which uh, includes the zona glomerulosa, the zona fasciculata, and the zona reticularis. So you can remember the, the order there, uh, GFR, like glomerular filtration rate. GFR is the order from outside going in. And then inside the cortex, you have the medulla, which is what produces the, uh, the uh, catecholamines, as we mentioned. So the products of each of these zones uh, in the cortex, um, the, the zona glomerulosa produces the mineralocorticoids. Think of minerals, think of sodium and salt. Uh, and as we'll talk about, the mineralocorticoids are involved in salt and water retention. So glomerulosa, mineralocorticoids, salt. Fasciculata, the zona fasciculata, um, is the site of production of the glucocorticoids. And uh, these are called glucocorticoids because they were first identified to have a lot of action on glucose. So when you hear glucocorticoids, think glucose, think sugar, produced uh, in the uh, fasciculata. And then the zona reticulata is the site of production of the androgens. And when you think of androgens, think of sex. So the mnemonic you can remember, from the outside working your way in is salt, then sugar, then sex. And uh, the way that's taught is uh, the phrase, the deeper you go, the sweeter it gets. It's a little risque, but you can remember it, can't you? Let's talk about the control of hormone synthesis. Uh, production of the mineralocorticoids is regulated by the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. The uh, production of glucocorticoids is um, more difficult to uh, explain or more involved anyway. If you look at the image on the screen, you'll see that the hypothalamus produces corticotropin-releasing hormone, and then that affects the anterior pituitary, which produces ACTH, which is adrenocorticotropic hormone, also called corticotropin. It's pretty easy to remember what these hormones do and where they come from. The releasing hormones almost always come from the hypothalamus, so corticotropic releasing hormone, or corticotropin-releasing hormone, rather, comes from uh, the hypothalamus, and then the uh, ACTH, which is corticotropin, um, it comes from the anterior pituitary. The production of androgens is also regulated by ACTH and therefore regulated by uh, CRH. And then the catecholamines produced in the medulla uh, are regulated by the preganglionic sympathetic fibers. Those have a synapse in the medulla uh, so that when uh, you get that, that sympathetic impulse, uh, 
it causes the medulla to start releasing um, the, uh, the catecholamines. But again, most of this lecture is going to focus not on the catecholamines, not on the androgens, but just on the corticosteroids, which are the glucocorticoids and the mineralocorticoids. And at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about some drugs that inhibit the corticosteroids, but those aren't nearly as important as the uh, steroids themselves. So then let's look at the adrenocorticosteroids. And we'll look at the mechanism of action of these, uh, of these hormones. So as we look at this image, we see that the corticosteroid binds to a receptor that is intracellular. It's not an extracellular receptor. It binds to this receptor, and then in the cytosol, that receptor complex dimerizes, so you have two of these moving together. Um, the, the receptors for glucocorticoids are, are found in most tissues of the body. They're widely distributed throughout the body. The receptors for mineralocorticoids, it's the same type of receptor, but it's mainly found in the uh, excretory organs, such as the kidney, and then also the colon, the salivary glands, and the sweat glands. And remember that the mineralocorticoids are involved in sodium and water retention, so that's the main site of sodium and water retention, is in the sweat glands, the kidneys, and so forth. So these dimerized receptors move into the nucleus, and they act as uh, gene promoters, uh, or transcription factors, that turn genes on and off. That's the basic mechanism of how uh, adrenal steroid hormones work. They, uh, they influence uh, gene transcription, and therefore they influence protein production. Um, the effects are fairly tissue specific. And remember that because this is a, a, an issue of gene transcription and protein production, it takes time for these steroid hormones to work. It takes time for them to produce an effect. So rather than go in the order that Lippincott presents these, I'm going to go out of order a little bit and start at the outer zone, the zona glomerulosa and the mineralocorticoids, and we'll work our way inward. So aldosterone is the main mineralocorticoid produced in the body, um, although cortisol, which is primarily a glucocorticoid, does have some mineralocorticoid activity, and a lot of the synthetic steroids have some mineralocorticoid activity, even though they're primarily glucocorticoids. Fludrocortisone is one that has primarily mineralocorticoid activity. It's a very strong mineralocorticoid. There's another one, desoxycorticosterone. Uh, desoxycorticosterone uh, is about 10% as potent uh, as fludrocortisone, but it primarily is a mineralocorticoid as well. So as I've mentioned, these mineralocorticoids help to regulate water volume and concentration of electrolytes, especially sodium and potassium. So the mineralocorticoids act on the tubules of the kidneys, and they also act on the collecting ducts and uh, they cause the kidney to reabsorb sodium and bicarbonate and then water. The mineralocorticoids also decrease reabsorption of potassium so that potassium is lost with water in the urine. Um, so think for a minute, if you have a patient with excessive aldosterone, uh, overproduction of aldosterone is a syndrome we call Kahn's syndrome, C-O-N-N, Kahn's syndrome. Is that patient with excess aldosterone going to be hyperkalemic or hypokalemic? They're going to be hypokalemic because they're losing a lot of potassium. If you have a patient with aldosterone deficiency in a condition called Addison's disease where they have uh, adrenal failure, uh, adrenal cortex failure primarily, um, are they going to be hyperkalemic or hypokalemic? These patients are going to be hyperkalemic. So if you have a patient who comes in with hyperkalemia, you're not really sure why, they're not taking any drugs that might cause that, uh, and they're not uh, on any kind of potassium supplement, you need to be thinking maybe this patient has Addison's disease. Mineralocorticoids also enhance sodium reabsorption in the gastrointestinal mucosa and in the sweat and salivary glands, as I mentioned. Um, so uh, again, in these patients with aldosterone excess, in the patient with Kahn's syndrome, are they going to have high sodium or low sodium? They're going to be relatively hypernatremic. may not be really profound, but they may be uh, they may have high sodium. And then in the patient with Addison's disease who has aldosterone deficiency, are they going to be hypernatremic or hyponatremic? That's a possible cause of hyponatremia. Addison's disease is one of those things on the long differential of things that can give you low sodium or hyponatremia. Um, high aldosterone levels can also lead to alkalosis along with the hypokalemia. Um, and, and you can have retention of sodium in water, and so you can get hypertension if you have high levels of aldosterone. And hyperaldosteronism is generally treated with spironolactone, which we'll talk about in a little bit toward the end of the lecture. It's an aldosterone antagonist. So that pretty much does it for the mineralocorticoids. Next, let's turn our attention to the glucocorticoids.
So let's talk a little bit about terminology here. Technically speaking, when we say corticosteroids, we mean both glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids. But most of the time when a physician starts talking about corticosteroids, they're really talking about glucocorticoid action. To make this even more confusing, most of the time we don't even bother to say corticosteroids, we just say steroids. So when doctors start talking about steroids, they're usually talking about corticosteroids, and they're really talking about glucocorticoid action. Um, when we talk about treating a disease with steroids, we're talking about giving, giving some type of glucocorticoid. Um, chemically speaking, though, aldosterone is a steroid. Estrogens and androgens are steroids. Uh, progesterone is a steroid. So we're not really being technically correct, but be aware that when you hear steroid, most doctors are talking about glucocorticoids. And then to make things even further confusing, um, when most of the people in the public hear the word steroids, they're thinking about anabolic steroids. Uh, and they think about performance enhancing drugs. So when I'm starting someone on prednisone for something, um, I, I'll say, now, I'm, a, I'm afraid that this drug is going to ruin your chance of playing Major League Baseball. And they'll laugh a little bit, you know. Uh, and then I explain that this is a totally different kind of steroid. It's not going to make them bulk up. It's not going to give them roid rage. And it kind of puts them at ease. As I mentioned, cortisol is the main glucocorticoid produced in the body. Um, it's produced in a diurnal fashion, meaning it has two peaks throughout the day. It's produced uh, early in the morning, uh, and then there's a smaller peak later in the afternoon. And it's thought that this, this peak of, of glucocorticoid first thing in the morning uh, is going to kind of raise your blood pressure because of the mineralocorticoid effect. It's going to raise your blood sugar, kind of give you something to get going in the morning. So you have this peak of glucocorticoid of cortisol production um, first thing in the morning, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Secretion of the glucocorticoids, such as cortisol, is also influenced by stress and by levels of circulating steroids. If you have a high level of steroids in your body, say you're giving someone steroids, that's going to suppress ACTH production and therefore suppress further cortisol production. And this is very important clinically. We'll talk about this in just a moment. So there's a long list of synthetic glucocorticoids, which include cortisone, Hydrocortisone. Hydrocortisone is essentially the same thing as cortisol. It's just produced synthetically. There's prednisone, prednisolone, methylprednisolone, dexamethasone, beclomethasone, betamethasone, fluticasone, uh, budesonide. Pay attention to that one because it has a different suffix. It's not an own like the rest of these. Uh, so budesonide, mometasone, triamcinolone. So what exactly do glucocorticoids do? They have lots of effects on the body. So they have an effect on metabolism. They cause gluconeogenesis. They promote gluconeogenesis. They basically uh, increase amino acid uptake by the liver and the kidney, and they activate some gluconeogenic enzymes, so they promote gluconeogenesis. Um, so if you have a patient with diabetes and you have to give them high dose of steroids for something, what is it going to do? It's going to raise their blood sugar. They may get hyperglycemic. Um, other effects on metabolism you can put there on the study guide inc include uh, protein catabolism, which is protein breakdown, except in the liver where it actually promotes um, a little protein synthesis. And then they also stimulate lipolysis or, or breakdown of fat. Um, and again, this protein catabolism and lipolysis um, produces the, uh, the energy and the building blocks that the body needs to uh, synthesize glucose. The second thing that the glucocorticoids do is they increase the body's resistance to stress. And that can be emotional stress, that can be physical stress, um, starvation, uh, the stress of surgery, the stress of illness. Um, when you raise glucose, you're, you're raising the body's energy level, so it has the energy to combat the stress, to fight disease, to fight trauma, to fight infection. Um, any type of debilita debilitating disease, these patients will have high levels of cortisol circulating. Um, they can also cause a modest rise in blood pressure because of uh, uh, vasoconstriction. And um, in adrenal insufficiency, where suddenly you don't have any glucocorticoids being produced, uh, you can get hypotension. Let's look at the effects uh, on the blood count. They are going to do two things to your white blood cells. They're going to decrease circulating lymphocytes and eosinophils and basophils and monocytes. They're going to take them out of the circulation and redistribute them to the lymphoid tissue. Um, and this basically compromises the body's ability to fight infection. So um, glucocorticoids are going to suppress or inhibit the immune system. Um, this is important when you're treating some cancers such as leukemia, um, acute lymphocytic leukemia, 
and also Hodgkin's lymphoma, where you have high numbers of lymphocytes, you're trying to reduce those, you give steroids to reduce those circulating lymphocytes. But glucocorticoids are also going to increase the neutrophils, or the polymorphonucleocytes, so the overall white count may rise. So a patient who has leukocytosis, don't always assume that that means they have an infection. Just because they have a high white blood cell count doesn't mean they have an infection. They could have uh, a lot of steroids on board, they could be uh, leukemic, they could be under a lot of stress. Remember, the body's, res uh, the body's reaction to stress is to secrete cortisol to fight that stress, and that can raise the white blood cell count. Other hematologic effects of glucocorticoids, they can increase the uh, hemoglobin level, they increase the number of red blood cells, and they also increase platelets. Now, the most important effect of glucocorticoids for therapeutic use is their anti-inflammatory properties. These drugs are going to dramatically reduce the inflammatory response. As we already mentioned, they're going to inhibit lymphocytes, they're going to inhibit macrophages. They also inhibit phospholipase A2, which is an enzyme that's important in the synthesis of arachidonic acid, which is a precursor of uh, inflammatory molecules such as prostaglandins and leukotriene. So if you inhibit the enzyme that produces these, um, you're going to inhibit uh, the inflammatory response that they're involved in. Um, glucocorticoids also interfere with mast cell degranulation, so you have decreased histamine, you have decreased capillary permeability. So very strong anti-inflammatory effects, very important to know about those. As I mentioned, there's feedback inhibition on ACTH and corticotropin releasing hormone production. Glucocorticoids will also inhibit TSH secretion. They will also stimulate growth hormone production. Glucocorticoids can also have effects on other systems. For instance, cortisol is necessary to maintain glomerular filtration rate. Um, high doses of glucocorticoids stimulate uh, gastric acid production and pepsin production, so that can exacerbate ulcer disease, peptic ulcer disease. Um, gl uh, glucocorticoids can have significant effects on the central nervous system. They can produce euphoria, they can produce behavioral changes, they often make a patient feel kind of jittery and ramped up and patients will tell you, you put me on this drug and I was up at 3 a.m. you know vacuuming the, the floor mats of the car, washing the car, vacuuming the house, cleaning the baseboards, I just I have all this energy. Sometimes they like that, sometimes they don't and so warn patients about this before you start them on these drugs. Chronic therapy with glucocorticoids can cause bone loss, osteoporosis, which we'll talk about under adverse effects. Uh, they can cause myopathy, muscle wasting, muscle weakness. So there's a lot of effects on the, the body. As I mentioned, glucocorticoid receptors are found in tissues throughout the body, so a lot of effects from these, these drugs. Okay, now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time for you to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we're going to go through the quick review in your study guide. Welcome to Stepping Up with me, Richard Sammons. Step up, you. Let's keep it going, people. And one, two, three, four. Don't want no fatties on my floor. Five, six, seven, eight. It's pop quiz time, so get it straight. Which synthetic corticosteroid is chemically identical to cortisol? And think, think, think. Think, think. That's right, hydrocortisone. And which synthetic corticosteroid has the strongest mineral corticoid effect? You guessed it, fludrocortisone. With sodium and water retention as a side effect, we better double time it. So let's go ahead and go through the quick review questions. What mineralocorticoid medication is used to treat patients with hypoaldosteronemia? This was mentioned by Dr. McGinnis earlier. It is fludrocortisone. Fludrocortisone is the mineral corticoid that uh, is given in drug form. Number two, which glucocorticoid matches the following descriptions? So your two long-acting glucocorticoids include betamethasone and dexamethasone. Those are your two go-to long-acting glucocorticoids. Your short-acting glucocorticoids are hydrocortisone and cortisone. The one that um, is a high-dose IV steroid given in acute spinal cord injury patients. You have a patient that's been in a motor vehicle, motor vehicle accident, comes to the ER with a spinal cord injury. 
and uh, you want to reduce inflammation around the spinal cord to make sure there's no persistent damage. In this case, methylprednisolone is going to be your drug of choice. Methylprednisolone. The next one, preferred steroid in patients with cirrhosis because it does not have to be metabolized by the liver. So prednisone, when you give it, has to be metabolized to the, by the liver. What is it metabolized by the liver to? Prednisolone. So you can bypass this pathway just by giving prednisolone. So if you're going to give a steroid to a cirrhotic patient, go with prednisolone because it does not have to be metabolized by the liver. And the next one, topical over-the-counter anti-itch cream is hydrocortisone. Number three, what, are the most, what is the most notable effect in the CBC in the first few days after a steroid has been started on a patient? So this is a clinical pearl for you guys. When you start a steroid on a patient in the hospital, maybe for pneumonia, maybe for meningitis, you're going to see an elevation in leukocytes. Their white blood cell count is going to be elevated. And uh, if you have an inpatient, this might freak you out sometimes. You're rounding one day. You might have a slightly elevated white blood cell count, and the next day you come in your round and you see that the white blood cell count is hugely elevated. You're like, man, this infection is getting so much worse. It's not the case it's getting worse. It is the case that you gave steroids to the patient, which raised their white blood cell count, um, specifically by raising neutrophils, right? So it's one of the things you're going to see on a CBC when you give steroids. Number four. What enzyme is inhibited by glucocorticoids that accounts for the anti-inflammatory effects of steroids? You need to know this enzyme. It's phospholipase A2. Glucocorticoids like prednisone, cortisol, they inhibit phospholipase A2. And if you, if you don't have activity of phospholipase A2, you cannot generate arachidonic acid. And arachidonic acid is used to make your prostaglandins, prostacyclins, leukotrienes. So you can't make any of those if you can't make arachidonic acid because you're inhibiting phospholipase A2. Make sure you know that. All right, so that's all I have for you right now. Let's get back to Dr. Mike. Let's talk then about various therapeutic uses of the adrenal corticosteroids, primarily the glucocorticoids. Um, as I mentioned before, there are lots of different options, lots of different formulations, lots of different drugs available. Um, and, and which one you choose is based on their anti-inflammatory potency or their glucocorticoid potency. It's also based on mineralocorticoid effects. Maybe you want to have a lot of mineralocorticoid effect. Maybe you want to avoid them. So you're going to choose a drug based on that. And then also duration of action. You may need a long-acting drug. You may need, may need a very short-acting drug. The first use of, of corticosteroids that's mentioned in Lippincott's is replacement therapy for primary adrenocortical insufficiency. And as I mentioned, this is Addison's disease. You may have heard of Addison's disease. Uh, John F. Kennedy had Addison's disease, and he was on uh, glucocorticoids for this. Um, Addison's disease is a disease of uh, adrenal cortex dysfunction. Usually affects cortisol production more than aldosterone production, but it can affect both. Um, the symptoms of Addison's disease include fatigue, weight loss, hyperpigmentation of the skin, hypotension, hyperkalemia, as we mentioned, hypoglycemia, hypercalcemia, metabolic acidosis. So you can have a lot of effects from Addison's disease. And it's often difficult because these are pretty nonspecific um, symptoms and, and presentation. So it's sometimes difficult to recognize Addison's disease. The way we diagnose it is we use a synthetic form of ACTH called cosyntropin. And when you give cosyntropin, it should stimulate cortisol release. So if you measure cortisol and then give the cosyntropin and then measure cortisol a little bit later and the cortisol doesn't rise as expected, you know you have some adrenal insufficiency and you suspect the patient has Addison's disease. The treatment of Addison's disease involves replacing the glucocorticoid with hydrocortisone. As I mentioned, hydrocortisone is chemically identical to cortisol. So you give hydrocortisone. Um, if you don't give hydrocortisone, these patients will die. This is a, a profoundly dangerous disease. It's difficult to recognize. It's fairly rare, but these patients will die without hydrocortisone. You give about two-thirds of the daily dose of hydrocortisone uh, in the morning and about a third given later in the day. And again, you're trying to mimic that physiologic diurnal variation in cortisol production. You also may need to give fludrocortisone, which is that potent mineralocorticoid we mentioned, um, if the patient's not producing enough aldosterone. The next therapeutic use of the glucocorticoids or the adrenal corticoids um, is replacement therapy for secondary and tertiary adrenal cortical insufficiency. This is very similar in presentation to Addison's disease, but it's a different defect. It's either a defect in ACTH production, which is secondary adrenal cortical insufficiency, or a, a defect in CRH production, that 
corticotropin releasing hormone production in the hypothalamus, which gives rise to tertiary uh, adrenal cortical insufficiency. The treatment for both of these, again, hydrocortisone. You're replacing the cortisol that the patient is just not producing. The next use of this is in the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome. Now, we've just been talking about Addison's disease, which is where you have adrenal cortical insufficiency. Cushing syndrome is where you have uh, hypersecretion of glucocorticoids, and it can be due to excessive release of ACTH by the anterior pituitary or by excessive production of cortisol by, the, uh, by an adrenal tumor or, or a primary adrenal process. You will also talk a little bit about Cushing, uh, Cushing syndrome being caused by drugs. If you give a lot of steroids, they're going to have what we call iatrogenic Cushing syndrome. Um, the symptoms of Cushing syndrome are related to hypercortisolism. So you're going to have hypertension because of some mineralocorticoid effect. You're going to have hypokalemia. You'll have central obesity. Um, you'll have other Cushingoid features, which we'll talk about much more extensively under adverse effects of these drugs. But the way we use this in the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome is, a, is the potent long-acting glucocorticoid called dexamethasone. We use it in a dexamethasone suppression test. Uh, the dexamethasone suppression test is used for the diagnosis of Cushing's syndrome. Um, so basically, you're going to check cortisol levels at night. You're going to give the patient a dose of dexamethasone, usually just an oral pill of dexamethasone, and then you're going to check cortisol in the morning. You may also check ACTH. If the cortisol is suppressed, and ACTH is suppressed, that is a normal response to dexamethasone. Because as I mentioned, you have a negative uh, feedback on the, uh, the anterior pituitary. So if you give uh, a high dose of steroids, you're going to reduce the amount of ACTH that's produced subsequent to that. So normally, we're going to suppress um, cortisol when you give dexamethasone. Um, if, if the cortisol is suppressed, we know the adrenal glands are functioning properly. We know the anterior pituitary is functioning properly. Um, at least with regard to ACTH and cortisol. If you do the dexamethasone suppression test and ACTH is low and cortisol is not suppressed, that suggests that the adrenal glands are overproducing cortisol. We have low ACTH because of that constant negative inhibition. If the ACTH is normal or elevated and the cortisol is not suppressed, that su suggests we have primary ACTH production. We have to do further testing to decide if there's a pituitary tumor that's producing ACTH or if there's ectopic ACTH production from various cancers, such as lung cancer or prostate cancer or cervical cancer, can produce ectopic ACTH. And you can do what's called a high-dose dexamethasone suppression test um, that you can actually suppress any pituitary production of ACTH and decide what, is, what else may be going on. And then the most important use of glucocorticoids is in relief of inflammatory symptoms. As I mentioned, the uh, anti-inflammatory effect is very important. Um, this can be uh, used in uh, rheumatologic disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, psoriatic arthritis, polymyalgia rheumatica, uh, erythema nodosum, uh, polymyositis. Primarily, we use prednisone or methylprednisolone. Prednisone uh, usually given orally, and methylprednisolone is usually given uh, as an IV uh, or IM injection. Um, these are also used in inflammatory bone and joint disease, such as osteoarthritis, bursitis, tendonitis. Um, I would strongly encourage you to find out more about using uh, corticosteroids for gout. It's a very safe treatment. It's very potent anti-inflammatory effect, much safer than using some of the more traditional gout drugs. And uh, I, think, uh, I think using prednisone for the treatment of acute gout is very effective. Um, uh, these drugs are also used to treat temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis and other forms of vasculitis. And they're also used for inflammatory symptoms of the skin, such as dermatitis, poison ivy. You can give systemic, um, systemic prednisone, uh, give prednisone pills for a week for a patient who has contact dermatitis from poison ivy or poison oak, and that's very, very effective. And then also for things like eczema, which are local inflammation of the skin. Uh, we use glucocorticoids uh, for the treatment of allergies. There's lots of different drugs we use for this. Um, uh, these come as steroid nasal sprays for allergic rhinitis. You can use fluticasone, budesonide, mometasone, triamcinolone, and beclomethasone. Um, there's also use for uh, systemic uh, glucocorticoids for uh, allergies to drugs, transfusion reactions, drug reactions, that sort of thing. There's a wide use of glucocorticoids for pulmonary disease and various types of pulmonary disease. For instance, we use uh, aerosol 
uh, glucocorticoids or powder form of inhaled glucocorticoids for asthma. Uh, the drugs used for asthma include fluticasone, triamcinolone, um, beclomethasone. We also use uh, these powder forms and these aerosol forms for treatment of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD because it reduces the inflammation involved there. Um, sometimes we use these drugs for the treatment of uh, acute bronchitis or, or uh, acute pneumonia, um, especially if they're having systemic response to this. Uh, if they're having a lot of wheezing, a lot of bronchospasm, and a lot of difficulty breathing, giving the steroids can reduce some of that bronchospasm and reduce some of that inflammation and help the patient breathe, even though it's also suppressing the body's ability to fight the underlying infection. So you have to treat with an antibiotic as well. But sometimes you'll have viral pneumonia and, uh, and viral bronchitis, and you can treat that with steroids just to help the patient feel better. It's not going to fight the infection any better. In fact, it may slow down the fighting of the infection, but it is going to help the patient feel better. Sometimes these drugs are used for acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. Um, it hasn't really been shown to work terribly well, but they are used, especially IV um, glucocorticoids. You can use oral or IV glucocorticoids for the treatment of pulmonary sarcoidosis, which is an inflammatory response in the, in the lungs. Um, we also use these to uh, accelerate lung maturation in premature newborns. Um, if, uh, if, if a, a baby is about to be born premature and you, you know that the, the mother's going into labor or they have premature eruption of the membranes or something along those lines and, and you know that this baby is going to be delivered and you want to give the body every chance to develop healthy lungs before delivery, uh, to, to mature the lungs, you give IM or intramuscular betamethasone to the mother 48 hours prior to delivery and then again 24 hours prior to delivery. Betamethasone will actually stimulate um, lung maturation because in the fetus, cortisol regulates lung maturation and speeds the process up. You also use glucocorticoids um, for immunosuppression following transplant. You have a patient who has a kidney transplant, they're on other immunosuppressive drugs, but they'll also be on prednisone very often. Uh, as I mentioned, sometimes we use um, steroids to treat various infections. I mentioned pneumonia and bronchitis. In certain situations, you may give steroids to treat meningitis. Um, it's sometimes used to treat sepsis or septic shock um, or the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, which is SIRS, S-I-R-S. Um, again, it's not clear that it's really beneficial, but it's often done because these patients are very sick and uh, you, you're trying to do anything you can to help them. And then as I mentioned, um, Prednisone and other glucocorticoids are used in the treatment of certain cancers to reduce lymphocyte load. Let's talk for a moment about the pharmacokinetics of these drugs. As I mentioned, there's lots and lots of different routes of administration. Some of these drugs are given orally. Some of these drugs are given as injection, either intramuscular injection or IV injection. Um, occasionally, we'll do injection into the joint space for uh, joint disease, and, um, um, whether it be gout or uh, osteoarthritis or other acute inflammation of joints, you'll give an intra-articular injection um, into the shoulder, into the knee, and so forth. As I mentioned, these are administered as nasal sprays, they're administered as aerosol inhalations, like a, a little inhaler, like an asthma inhaler, uh, or they also have uh, powder forms to inhale, and then these are also used as topical creams and, and ointments and lotions and that sort of thing. The absorption and fate of these drugs Oral steroids are readily absorbed from the GI tract. Um, about 90% or more of the glucocorticoids are protein bound in the, in the serum, in the plasma. Um, most of these drugs are metabolized by the liver and then conjugated to glucuronic acid or sulfate and then they're excreted by the kidney. Let's talk a little bit about glucocorticoid dependence. This is a very important topic. Um, this is not something where they necessarily become psychologically dependent and they're jonesing for their steroids, but their body is physically dependent on it. Um, as I mentioned, um, large doses of steroids, especially over prolonged periods of time, more than a couple of weeks, you're going to suppress the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the HPA axis. You're going to suppress the ability of the body to produce its own cortisol. So there are a couple of ways to avoid this. One thing you can do is use what they call alternate day administration. You can give a higher dose of the steroid every other day and uh, that allows the HPA axis to recover and function on its own on the days between doses. Um, you can also get away with these larger doses without causing more side effects, which is a good thing. Um, 
when a patient is acutely ill, maybe they're hospitalized, maybe they're undergoing surgery, especially when they're in the ICU, the stress of the illness increases the body's demand for glucocorticoids. And if they have any adrenal suppression already, or relatively suppressed because they've been on some steroids, they can get much sicker much more quickly. So you need to be, take a careful history and see if they've been on glucocorticoids in the last few weeks. And if so, you may need to give them what we call stress dose steroids. You give them a, a high dose of steroids um, and, and, and then gradually taper that down. Um, it's not entirely clear from the, the scientific literature how valuable this is, but again, it's, it's one of those theoretical things that is often done. There are some studies that suggest if you just continue the patient on their regular dose of glucocorticoid, you don't have to give them a higher dose for the stress of the illness. But either way, when a patient's been on these drugs, you don't want to just stop them abruptly because the patient will then be uh, adrenal insufficient. They'll have basically sort of an, iatrog an iatrogenic form of Addison's disease, and they may die. And it could be very dangerous. They get hypotensive, hypoglycemic, et cetera. So you, you can't stop these drugs abruptly. You have to sort of gradually wean the patient off and allow their adrenals and their uh, hypothalamus and pituitary to start producing the normal hormones. Um, and, and so, as a general rule, if the patient's been on uh, a glucocorticoid for a month, you're going to wean them off for a month. If the patient's been on for a year, you're going to wean them off over a year. So it could be a very, very slow process to get these patients off of these drugs. Next, we're going to talk about the adverse effects of glucocorticoids. This is a long list of adverse effects. These are very important. You'll see why uh, we're so cautious with using um, glucocorticoids. So the most common uh, adverse effect of glucocorticoids is osteoporosis. As I mentioned, um, glucocorticoids are going to suppress uh, calcium absorption from the gut, they're going to inhibit bone formation, and they're also going to decrease sex hormone synthesis. And those sex hormones, especially the estrogens in women, are going to help maintain bone mass. So if you suppress that, you're worsening bone mass and you're going to get osteoporosis. Patients who are on steroids long term are going to be advised to, uh, to take calcium and to take vitamin D. You may also need to consider giving them an osteoporosis medication, such as alendronate. Um, and, and it's important to know that if you try that alternate day dosing to prevent the HPA axis suppression, you're not going to prevent osteoporosis. So you need, really need to have um, a high index of suspicion and test these patients for osteoporosis if they're on chronic steroids, and you need to do whatever you can to prevent the osteoporosis. You can also get a, a syndrome that looks very much like Cushing's syndrome. Uh, we call it a Cushingoid appearance. Um, and you really need to recognize this because you're going to see it on the wards, you're going to see it on tests. It's really, really important. It's very common. Um, you get redistribution of the body fat. So you get central obesity or centripetal obesity. These patients may have normal thin arms and legs, but then their, their, their trunk is kind of obese. Um, they get what we call moon facies. That's where their, their face gets kind of round and fat and it looks like a big moon. They get what's called a buffalo hump where they get a hump kind of on the back of their neck, and that's sort of a fat distribution thing where they get this fat pad that builds up. Um, they can have hyperglycemia, they can have increased body hair growth, and they can have acne. So this Cushing appearance, Cushingoid appearance is very important for you to recognize. Um, other adverse effects of glucocorticoids, they have an increased risk of uh, cataracts, they have an increased risk of glaucoma. As I mentioned, you can have hyperglycemia and you can get uh, diabetes. Uh, sort of an iatrogenic diabetes or a, a steroid-induced diabetes from taking these drugs. Um, you can get hypokalemia, and you may need to supplement with potassium because, again, these glucocorticoids very often have some mineralocorticoid effect, so you're going to have some potassium wasting in the urine. Glucocorticoids will lower the seizure threshold. They'll cause muscle weakness and muscle atrophy, as we mentioned before. They'll cause thinning of the skin and skin atrophy, so patients may be on steroids and they're, they're suddenly having skin that's very thin and brittle and maybe tears, maybe bleeds and bruises easily. Um, you can have increased risk of peptic ulcers, as we mentioned. You have increased susceptibility to infections. And you'll very often have stimulation of the appetite and weight gain. So some of this weight gain in the face and in the body um, is just related to increased intake. You really need to be familiar with these side effects, though. This is very common stuff and very important. Let's talk next about the inhibitors of adrenocorticoid biosynthesis. Now, I'll be honest, these are very rarely used for the most part. This is not really high yield stuff in real life, but you need to be familiar with it. So I'll just talk about the individual drugs and what they're used for. The first drug is metiripone. 
this is a drug that blocks the final step in the synthesis of cortisol. That's the, synth the step of 11-hydroxylation. Uh, um, this is sometimes used to treat pregnant women who have Cushing syndrome. It used to be used uh, to test for Cushing syndrome, but now we use dexamethasone primarily for the dexamethasone suppression test. The next drug is aminoglutethamide. This inhibits conversion of cholesterol to pregnenolone, which is one of the first steps of adrenal steroid production. Um, so this inhibits uh, the synthesis of all the hormonally active steroids down the chain. This used to be used in the treatment of breast cancer uh, to reduce or eliminate androgen and estrogen production, but now we more commonly use tamoxifen. The next drug is ketoconazole, and you may recognize that. That's an antifungal agent used to fight fungus infections. But it's been found that it strongly inhibits uh, the hormone synthesis uh, of adrenal steroids and all gonad steroid hormones. So you can give high doses of ketoconazole to uh, suppress uh, the steroid hormone synthesis. And this is sometimes used to treat patients who have Cushing syndrome. The next drug is trilostane, which reversi reversibly inhibits 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, which is an early step in that, uh, that production of, of steroid hormones that we saw earlier. Uh, this, so this affects aldosterone production, cortisol, and all the gonadal hormone synthesis. Um, again, this used to be used for Cushing syndrome, but as of 1994, it's no longer available for human use. Um, it has some use for treatment of Cushing syndrome in dogs. The next drug is mifepristone, which is an anti-progestin drug. Um, at high doses, it has potent anti-glucocorticoid effects. It's a glucocorticoid antagonist. It forms a complex with the glucocorticoid receptor, but then it rapidly dissociates from the receptor um, after it's gone into the, uh, the nucleus, so it, it doesn't really do anything as far as gene transcription. Um, its use is limited to patients uh, with ectopic ACTH syndrome who are inoperable. So a patient who has lung cancer is producing ectopic ACTH, they can't have surgery for whatever reason, um, they might be treated with mifepristone. Now the last two drugs are ones that you may actually see used sometime. The first of these is spironolactone, which is used as an anti-hypertension drug. Uh, it competes for the mineralocorticoid receptor. It's a mineralocorticoid antagonist. Uh, it's going to inhibit sodium resorption in the kidney. Um, it can antagonize aldosterone synthesis and testosterone synthesis a little bit. So it's used in the treatment of hypertension. It's also used in the treatment of congestive heart failure and in hyperaldosterone women and sometimes used to treat polycystic ovarian syndrome and hirsutism in women, which is excessive hair growth, women who start to grow a little beard and that sort of thing. You can, be treat, you can treat that with spironolactone. The adverse effects of spironolactone, um, it's going to cause potassium retention in the urine, so you can get hyperkalemia from it. Um, you can also get some gynecomastia. You can have menstrual irregularities. Uh, and skin rashes related to spironolactone use. And then the last drug, eplerinone, um, is similar to spironolactone. It also binds to the mineralocorticoid receptor and acts as an aldosterone antagonist. It's rarely used for hypertension, but it is considered to be a potassium-sparing diuretic. Um, it's only a mineralocorticoid antagonist, though it doesn't have any effect on testosterone. Um, and so it doesn't cause gynecomastia, which can be a big problem with spironolactone. Okay, now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time for you to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we're going to go through the quick review in your study guide. So let's go ahead and go through the quick review questions of the adrenal medications. Number one. What are the clinical signs and symptoms of primary adrenocortical insufficiency, also known as Addison's disease? So with Addison's disease, usually this is due to uh, autoimmunity. It's an autoimmune disease, usually, uh, causing adrenal atrophy. And as your adrenal glands atrophy, they're not going to make aldosterone or cortisol. And so what are the consequences of not having aldosterone or cortisol? Well, without these drugs, you're going to have hypotension. We also mentioned earlier you're going to have hyperkalemia, elevated potassium, and hyponatremia, decreased sodium levels. These patients are also very weak. They have malaise, anorexia, so they're not eating very well, weight loss, so very weak, frail patients have hypotension, electrolyte disturbances. Also, Dr. McGinnis mentioned that with Addison's disease, um, like um, 
uh, President Kennedy had, um, you have increased skin pigmentation. Maybe you can recall seeing images of President Kennedy and uh, how he always seemed to have tan skin. Well, he had increased skin pigmentation from Addison's disease. And just briefly to touch on why this takes place, whenever you have uh, a deficiency of these hormones, you're going to have excess generation of ACTH. Deficiency of cortisol means you have more ACTH generation, adrenal corticotrophic hormone. And so as a result of this, um, you're going to try to stimulate more cortisol production, but your precursor molecule to ACTH is a molecule called POMC. And when POMC breaks apart um, to form ACTH, you also are going to have the generation of a different hormone called MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone. So I'm sure you can understand why now when you have elevations of ACTH, you're going to have more MSH, more melanocyte stimulating hormone, more melanocytes, which means skin pigmentation. So that's a unique finding with Addison's disease. But moving on to number two, explain the following results from a dexamethasone suppression test in the patient with Cushing syndrome. So you have a patient with Cushing syndrome, you want to know why they're having Cushing syndrome. If they have Cushing syndrome because they're taking exogenous steroids, that's easy to diagnose. It's easy to discern because you know that they're taking exogenous steroids, usually by history. But uh, let's say you do a low-dose dexamethasone suppression test. So you give a little bit of dexamethasone, and that suppresses ACTH production. Um, that is indicative of primary adrenal um, Cushing syndrome. So um, the adrenal glands aren't functioning, maybe because of exogenous steroid use. The next scenario, a low-dose dexamethasone does not suppress ACTH, but high-dose does. So you can suppress ACTH production, with high enough doses, but a little bit is not going to do it. In this case, uh, this would be classic for a uh, Cushing disease, and Cushing disease is caused by a pituitary tumor which expresses ACTH. So um, you might do a, pitu a pituitary MRI to make that diagnosis if you, if you were to see that finding. And the next one, neither low or high dose dexamethasone suppresses ACTH production, so it doesn't matter how much dexamethasone you put in there, ACTH is not coming down. Um, in this case, you have a, uh, this could be due to a, a adrenal tumor, and the adrenal tumor uh, is a cortisol secreting adrenal tumor. Or in some cases, you can have small cell lung cancer that's expressing um, or um, that's elaborating ACTH. And so, in these cases, you would do an abdominal CT scan or a chest CT scan to help make that diagnosis. But uh, fundamentally, when you see this, it's a tumor, it's some type of cancer ex expressing a, a ton of cortisol. Number three, how are long-acting glucocorticoids useful in preterm labor? Um, so uh, if you have a patient preterm labor, you can give the mom uh, long-acting glucocorticoids, specifically your dexamethasone or betamethasone. And those are given for 48 hours prior to delivery to help mature the type 2 pneumocytes in the baby's lungs. So when the baby is born, there's a much lower incidence of neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. Now, I do want to, if you're using Lippincott's fourth edition, there is an error on page 314 regarding this, or 315 regarding this. So if you look on page 315, what's titled is number 7, acceleration of lung maturation. They say that they use beclomethasone um, uh, for this for this um, scenario, beclomethasone is a, is a steroid that's either inhaled to treat asthma or COPD, or it's given intranasally to treat allergic rhinitis, but it is not used for this instance. That should say betamethasone or dexamethasone, but not beclomethasone. So that's an error in Lippincott's. Number four, why does tertiary adrenal insufficiency occur when a long-term steroid is abruptly withdrawn? So whenever you're on steroids for a long period of time, you suppress your HPA axis, your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal hormone axis. And so these hormones are going to suppress, fundamentally at the, at the root cause, they're going to suppress um, corticotropic releasing hormone, CRH. They're going to suppress that. And so without CRH, you're not going to have any ACTH, and you're not going to have any cortisol production. So we call this a tertiary adrenal insufficiency. Your adrenals are insufficient, not because of cortisol specifically, not because of ACTH, but three levels upstream, your corticotropic releasing hormones. That's called a tertiary insufficiency. That's what's caused by exogenous steroids. And when you, abru when you abruptly withdraw them, your body can't recover from that very rapidly. This, this system needs to be put back into play, and it takes a while for that to take place. So it is, it is deadly. It's lethal. People die from this. Number five, as a general rule, 
rule, after what duration of steroid dosing should a patient be tapered off their steroid rather than stopped abruptly? So if you have a patient on steroids for five days, do you need to taper it? No, you don't. All right. So uh, if you have a patient that's on steroids for five days, you can just stop it abruptly in most patients. Okay, most patients, you can stop it abruptly, and they're not going to have any problems. Their HPA axis is just going to kick right back in because it's only been five days that it's, that it's been suppressed, and uh, it can pick right back up and do just fine. What about seven days? Yeah, you're probably pretty good with seven days. Most physicians feel pretty comfortable with five days, seven days. Somewhere between about 14 and 21 days is where it really starts to get a little bit uncomfortable. So definitely beyond 21 days, you definitely want to taper it. Most physicians will taper their steroid in their patients after about five or after about seven to 10 days. So seven to 10 days is where you start to get a little bit uncomfortable not tapering it. You're probably still safe, but it's, it's a better idea to, um, to be on the safe side, right? Because you don't want to put your patients at risk. First, do no harm, right? Okay, number six. A patient on long-term prednisone for her rheumatoid arthritis comes to the ER and is diagnosed with pneumonia. What changes, if any, need to be made to her steroid do dosage? So this is kind of a catch-22 scenario because you might be thinking, well, maybe she got pneumonia because she was on steroids and she was immuno immunosuppressed. And while that may be the case, this patient is addicted to her steroids, her HPA access has been suppressed. When you have an infection, we have a heart attack, whenever your body is exposed to stress, what does your body naturally do? It raises your stress hormone. It raises cortisol. This patient is not going to be able to raise their own cortisol because their, HCA, their HPA access is suppressed. So what are you going to have to do in this patient? You're going to have to take that steroid dose and increase it. You're going to have to provide a stress dose of steroids. This patient on chronic steroids is under stress, so they need more steroids to overcome that stress. Basically, you're, you're trying to mimic what the body would do on its own, but can't do because they're on chronic steroids. Number seven, a patient with systemic lupus is attempting to wean off steroids by reducing her dose by one milligram a day each week. That's a pretty reasonable way to reduce if you've been up for a very long time. But whenever she reaches five milligrams, she repeatedly has symptom worsening and weakness and is forced to increase her steroid dose. What is another manner in which she could taper her steroids so that her endogenous HPA axis can be reestablished? Dr. McGinnis mentioned this, um, taking a dose one day and then no dose the next day. So alternating your doses every other day is gonna allow your body to recover. So it allows, um, it allows your body to have sort of a holiday and to, and to try on its own to, uh, to restart the HPA access. So there's, uh, and somebody that's trying to taper, that's having a hard time, you might try this every other day protocol. It's just another little clinical pearl for you. Is it gonna be on your farm test? Probably not. Is it gonna be on step one? Definitely not, but it is a little cl clinical pearl. We're trying to help you be better doctors here. Number eight. What is the only glucocorticoid that has no effect on the fetus in pregnancy? This is testable. Prednisone is the answer here. Number nine, what should patients taking glucocorticoids for over three months take additionally for primary disease prevention? Dr. McGinnis mentioned that osteoporosis is a huge concern on patients with long-term steroids. Uh, anybody on steroids should definitely be on calcium and vitamin D supplementation. But if they're on steroids for over three months, they need to be on an additional thing, which is a bisphosphonate. How do we identify drugs that are bisphosphonates? They end in the suffix dronate, alindronate, pimindronate. These drugs, like alindronate, uh, they help um, inhibit osteoclasts, and in doing so, they prevent um, further osteoporosis. So patients on long-term steroids for over three months, they should be on a prophylactic bisphosphonate as well. Number 10. What are the various uses for spironolactone? So spironolactone has lots of different uses. Uh, and it can be used as a, uh, as a potassium sparing diuretic. So if you have patients on, on maybe furosemide uh, or hydrochlorothiazide and they're, they're spilling out potassium in their urine, you can use this potassium sparing diuretic to help retain potassium from the urine. Um, spironolactone also has various other uses because of its anti-adrenal hormone effect. So it is useful in the treatment of hirsutism um, which is, you know, uh, uh, male hair growth in females. And uh, the classic patient that is Hirsut is a patient with PCOS, a patient with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So they might be on spironolactone for that reason. Um, patients with um, excess testosterone, you know, they might have acne. 
Um, so another, another benefit of spironolactone, it helps decrease acne. So you might see some dermatologists using spironolactone simply for the acne reducing effects of it. Uh, it can be given as an antihypertensive. It's not usually the first line antihypertensive. Also, spironolactone helps decrease uh, morbidity and mortality in patients with congestive heart failure. So a lot of your congestive heart failure patients will be on a low dose of spironolactone for the, for the morbidity and mortality reduction. All right, that's all the uh, questions I have for you right now. I think we might have one more question, though. What are common side effects of long-term corticosteroid use? Let's go. Either you know or you don't. Osteoporosis, increased appetite and weight gain, hirsutism, cataracts, glaucoma. Yes, there are a lot of them. So, you need to know them. You are easily one of the laziest, most aggravating, worthless students in the history of this hospital. Okay, so now's a good time to pause the video and complete your in-session quiz, then restart the video and we'll go through the quiz together. Hello, I'm Dr. Chris Lewis. I'm here to give you your in-session quiz for adrenal hormones. Let's get started. Why is tapering corticosteroids after 5 to 14 days of use so important? Well, after long-term treatment, you're going to get suppression of your HPA axis. So your hypothalamus, your pituitary, and your adrenal gland. So abrupt removal of corticosteroids will cause an acute adrenal insufficiency syndrome. And this can be lethal. Um, HPA suppression can occur in, in treatments as short as 4 days. And what life-threatening infections might you seriously consider dosing corticosteroids with the antibiotic? Well, the first one is probably bacterial meningitis. Uh, the steroids dosed before or with the first dose of antibiotics can reduce the neurologic complications as a result of that problem. Chronic uh, granulomatous disease. And then the other one is a preterm uh, rupture of membranes. But this is not necessarily an infectious situation. Um, it's used mostly for uh, maturing the lungs of the infant. How are corticosteroids excreted and what metabolites appear? Well, they're metabolized by the liver, and those metabolites are conjugated with glucuronic acid or sulfate, and they're excreted by the kidney. Match the following clinical descriptions with the most appropriate inhibitor of adrenocorticoid biosynthesis. And your choices are metiripone, eplerinone, mifepristone, and aminoglutathiamide. A 60-year-old man with heart failure, well, you're going to use eplerinone. A 50-year-old woman with a tumor of her adrenal cortex, well, that's going to be aminoglucothiamide. A 36-year-old pregnant woman has Cushing syndrome, well, you're going to use metiripone. And a 41-year-old man with inoperable ectopic ACTH syndrome, and that's going to be mifepristone. What are the side effects of long-term use of glucocorticoid therapy? Well, you're going to get a decreased growth in children, osteoporosis, increased risk of infection, increased appetite, hypertension, emotional disturbances, peripheral edema, peptic ulcer, glaucoma, hypokalemia, hirsutism, and HPA suppression. By what mechanism do glucocorticoids induce osteoporosis? Well, glucocorticoids suppress intestinal calcium absorption, they inhibit bone formation, and they decrease sex hormone synthesis. What mineralocorticoid is given along with corticosteroids in cases of adrenal insufficiency? Well, that's going to be fludrocortisone. What abortifactant is a competitive inhibitor of glucocorticoid inhibitors? Well, that's mifepristone. What two steroids can be given at the onset of preterm labor to help protect the neonate from respiratory distress syndrome? There's actually an error in your Lippincott book, if you're following along with, with that resource. Uh, they use intranasal uh, beclomethazone uh, as an answer to uh, this question. But uh, in fact, the, the answer is dexamethasone and betamethasone, and either, either of those are good. You'll notice in your in-session quiz that there's a very large pathway um, graphic that shows the HPA pathway of uh, cortisol generation. We're not going to go over each and every one of these uh, things, but you should be very familiar with it. Explain the following results from a dexamethasone suppression test in a patient with Cushing syndrome. 
So if low dose dexamethasone suppresses ACTH, then you're more than likely to have a primary adrenal Cushing syndrome. If the low dose dexamethasone does not suppress the ACTH, but a high dose dexamethasone uh, does suppress the ACTH, then you're looking at Cushing's disease, which is uh, possibly a pituitary tumor. If neither low nor high dose dexamethasone suppress the ACTH, then you might be looking for a tumor that's causing an increased cortisol. Um, so this would be an ectopic ACTH syndrome. And if an adrenal tumor is not apparent, um, then you really need to do a, a chest CT or an abdominal CT uh, to look out to look for any other uh, secreting tumors. And that's the end of your in-session quiz for adrenal hormones.